Hi guys, Alec Pierce, scuba, vintage scuba. Now, some of you vintage guys uh, have been, at, in fact, this happened regularly, have been asking questions about what it was like to dive in the old days. Uh, well, I started diving in 1958 and uh, was certified in 1960. One of the questions that come up probably most repeatedly is, how did we control our buoyancy? Like today, you've got a buoyancy compensator, right? And you've got your exposure suit on, and you've got the right amount of weight so that you're close to neutral at the surface. And, and then when you want to go down, you let a bit of air to the BC, and you start to sink. And when you want to stop, you go, ch -ch -ch, and you stop. When you want to go up, if you're neutral, you thin a little bit. If you're negative, you go, ch -ch, a little bit of air, and you start to rise. And, and to slow down your buoyancy, you let air up. And you get to 15 feet. and. And you stop at 15 feet and you stay right there at 15 feet for three minutes and you look around and you go to the surface. That's called buoyancy control, meaning that you're able to stop anywhere you want. If you're on descent, you can stop. If you're on ascent, you can stop and stay where you are. That's buoyancy control. We didn't have that. <laughs> so to answer the questions, and several questions I've had from some of your readers, thank you very much for all your comments. I love them. That to answer those questions, uh, uh, how did we handle buoyancy control? I, we didn't have buoyancy control. We didn't know what buoyancy control was. We had no idea. We did know <clears throat> that you had to use, had to wear weights. How many weights did we put on? There's the question. There's the problem. Because if there was such a thing as buoyancy control, it went like this: through a process of trial and error, commonly called experience good or bad, <laughs> each diver would learn how many weights he needed to overcome the buoyancy of his particular wetsuit. Every diver had a wetsuit. Mm, could be a hood, boots, gloves, whatever. Had a wetsuit. And every diver was different. Body and wetsuit and everything else was different. So each diver had to determine, through trial and error, how many weights he needed in order to fairly easily start a descent. Now, we, we almost invariably uh, weighted ourselves so we were slightly positive at the surface. It seemed to be a smart thing to do, even today. That's a common practice. It seemed to be a smart thing to do. If you came to the surface and you wanted to relax, you could relax and you didn't keep sinking. So we were positive, slightly positive at the surface. So the weights that you had at the surface in order to do that, to start a descent, were too many weights for 30 feet. Ah, sure. When you got to 30 feet, the wetsuit was compressed. Now you weren't positive anymore. You were negative. Sometimes surprisingly so. And if you're going to go to 60 feet, maybe it was a 60 foot, which was a deep dive in those days. A 60 foot dive, when you got to 60 feet, you were walking around at the bottom like a hard hat diver. Definitely too many weights. Gosh, you could take your weight belt off and sit it on the bottom and look at it. Put it back on, almost. So how did we take care of that problem? Well, it was very simple. Again, trial and error. Experience. We would learn how many weights we needed for each depth that we were diving to. I learned through experience that at 55 feet, I needed to have eight pounds of weights. I needed 14 at the surface. I only needed eight at 55 feet. How did that work that out? Well, it was very simple. If you knew that you were going to make a dive to a certain depth, and you did, as I just explained, because you knew you were diving, then you would put on the amount of weights that you needed for that depth. Because it's at that depth that you're going to spend the majority of your time moving around, checking things out, digging for stuff, looking, and all that kind of stuff. So you put on the amount of weights that you needed. So if I was diving on the old train in the Fenland River, maybe some of you folks know what I'm talking about, then I would put on eight pounds of weights. That's it. And I'd be at the surface, ready to make my dive. Well, how do I get down? I need 14 pounds of weight to overcome the buoyancy of my wetsuit. There's a picture of me in 1965 diving in Fenton Falls. And, and, and Kevin's going to show you a close-up of this because this is a blow-up. And this picture was taken in 1965. It's not exactly high quality. In 1965, we didn't know what pixels were. And you can see that I have my weight belt on. And now here, I'm, in this picture, I'm only wearing a jacket, so I didn't need as much weight. I knew with the jacket only from my little chart that I had made up, my own personal dives, okay, uh, surface, uh, jacket only, I only needed 12 pounds. I needed 12 pounds at the surface, and I only needed 6 pounds if I was diving like that at 55. How did I compromise that? Well, it's simple. You only put on the 6 pounds. 
because you did not want to get stuck down there. You didn't want to have to drop your weight belt. I made those weights on my dad's workbench, and I got hecked for burning his workbench. I wasn't going to leave them down there. They're valuable. And so on, you see. What do we do? Well, it's very simple. We're diving in Fenland. And Fenland is noted for many things. Some good, some bad. One of the things it's noted for is the rocks. The bottom is littered with rocks. The shore, the, the Fenland Channel is cut through a limestone channel, but the river cut a limestone channel. And, and so there are rocks all over the place, nice rocks, big rocks like this, and thin and flat, so they're easy to hold on to. Ah, hey, if, you see, see what's happening here? So I'm at the surface. I'm going down to check out the train at 55 feet. I have on eight pounds of weights. I can't get down. That's all. I'm at the surface, right on the shore. I reach down and I pick up a nice big flat rock. Maybe this is about a four pound rock. I'd pick up one twice as big as this, an eight or nine or ten pound rock. Perfect. And I would hold that in my hand and off we go. I don't need that hand. I don't have a BC. I don't need to control the BC. I don't have a buddy. I don't have a safe second. I don't have any of that junk. So I got one hand completely free. I do need one hand for equalizing. So I keep one hand, I'm pulling my own, equalize, and I hold this in my hand. I, I slip out into the deeper water, I start to sink. And I get down eight or nine or ten feet, and I would bounce the rock a little. No, I still need it. So I let it, finally I get down to about 30 feet, and I let the rock go. Land on the bottom. Rock's not valuable, gone, disappears. And I would be able at that point to keep descending until I finally reached the bottom at 55 feet. Simple. Point C control. Uh -huh. Some of you smart guys out there saying, yeah, what happens when you come back up? How do you make your, your, your stop at 15 feet for three minutes so you don't get decompression sickness? What stop? <laughs> we didn't stop. Decom we knew about decompression sickness. Yeah, some of the U.S. Navy divers got that stuff. <laughs> we knew about it. We knew it caused it. We knew how to avoid it. But it wasn't a really big concern at that particular time. As far as, so, so a three minute safety stop at 15 feet, which is a fantastic idea, based on modern research, modern is a great idea. And I always practice that now in, in, any of our, in any of our dives. The idea was unheard of before, gosh, before the mid 80s, 90s almost. Unheard of, nobody made a safety stop. Didn't need to, you know, before. So <laughs> when it was time for me to come to the surface, I would start to thin up. And since I had the right amount of weights, I was close to neutral at 55 feet. After I came up about 15 to 20 feet, maybe 30 feet, so I got up to around 30 feet or so, I, I could stop thinning and I would slowly rise to the surface and I was faster and faster and I came to the surface and pop out. Ah, hi mom, because my mom was my diving buddy. She was sitting on the shore in, a, in, in an armchair, in a lawn, lawn chair knitting. Yeah, that was my dive. Hi, Mom, I'm back. Everything's okay. Good dive. And I would climb up. Just that simple. Buoyancy control in the Stone Age. <laughs> yep. Here's some more pictures. There's another picture of me. I think Kevin will show you this one as well. That's another picture of me. I don't think it's the same day, different day. Full wetsuit on. And you see my old duck feet fins that I bought from Honest Archie. And you see my weight belt and my tank sitting. I have my weight belt on and my tanks. This is a picture of myself and a dive buddy. <clears throat> a very good friend of mine, Paul Moore. And there I am again with my weight belts in front, full wetsuit. On how vintage divers, Stone Age divers, I like that, Kevin. That was Kevin's idea. Stone Age divers, how they controlled their buoyancy. They didn't really control their buoyancy. They chose their weights so they would be neutral or close to neutral. Uh, uh, at the depth they were going to dive, and they went down or got up. And it was a very, very common practice, and should still be a common practice, for divers to have some method of controlling the ascent and descent. So we commonly go from shore. You're going down where there's a steep slope or a very, very shallow slope, you're going down a slope. So if you got too heavy, you would land on the slope. You could drop some of the rocks you were carrying. Or, failing that, if you were lucky enough to have a boat, a lot of us didn't have boats. We were just kids then, you know, 8, 9, 10, 12 years old. We didn't have boats. But if you had a boat, you dropped an anchor line over. Of course you did. You put an anchor line down, good heavy anchor, and tie it to the boat. And then you could use the anchor line. You could use the anchor line to pull yourself down a little bit. Till you get down 55 feet, well, let's get, you let go of the anchor line, enjoy your dive. And then coming back up, as I say, you simply started your ascent and popped to the surface. I know, by today's training standards and the way you all dive today, that may sound kind of weird, but it worked. It worked really, really well. We were very, very dependent on our experiences, and it was a whole lot of fun. Hey, we were frogmen. It was great. It was what we had.
a lot of fun. I'll talk to you some more about this. I'll talk about some of the weights and how we did that and some other practices as well. I hope you enjoy it. Alec Pierce, scuba, vintage scuba, diving in the Stone Age. Talk to you soon.